One of the major discoveries from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, in the last few years was actually the discovery of the unusual formations above and below the galaxy we normally refer to as the Fermi Bubbles, named after the telescope, the Gamma Ray Telescope, that originally discovered them roughly around 12 years ago. And these particular formations at first did not really have much reason to be there until we realized they were most likely formed by a major expulsion from the center of the galaxy, from the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star. But even after years and years of investigation, there are still new mysteries being discovered about these bubbles, with some of them discussed in one of the videos you can find in the description below. But today we're going to be discussing another discovery, a discovery that might actually solve one of the mysteries about these formations, or actually a mystery within the mystery. If you were to look at the structure in more detail, you would actually start discovering some other features within it that are difficult to explain. There's one right here known as the cocoon. And the reason this cocoon is so mysterious is really because it seems to be much brighter than a lot of other spots. This particular region seems to produce more radiation, more powerful radiation, and seems to contain a lot of accelerated cosmic rays coming from this southern lobe. And all of this was actually discovered approximately 11 years ago in 2011. You can find the PDF that describes some of these discoveries in the description below. And so this cocoon was always also kind of mysterious. Why is it that this particular region seems to have more of everything in it? If this was a bipolar emission from our black hole, shouldn't it be more or less equally distributed? If there was more emissions and more radiation and more mass on one side, what's the actual reason for it? Now naturally this is just one of many mysteries about the Fermi bubbles and one of many such structures, but it looks like this particular mystery has now been solved. And specifically solved by the Australian scientists whose paper you can find in the description below, with the results from this paper providing very definitive solutions, but also providing an extremely logical explanation. So first of all, when studying the cocoon, or studying this particular region, the scientists realized that there's actually something else very close to it that was also discovered only a few years ago. It's slightly easier to see it in this image, but one of the major satellites of the Milky Way galaxy, known as Sagittarius Dwarf Spheroidal Galaxy, has its core right here. Okay, it's actually not really that easily visible, but we know that this right here, M54 or Massey 54 Globular Cluster, also very likely represents its core. But the rest of the galaxy is not particularly easily visible, and there's a really important reason for that. Over the period of several billion years, as it orbited around the Milky Way, it was actually tidally disrupted, spaghettified, turned into an extremely long string, and more or less absorbed otherwise. These are known as the stellar streams, and the scientists have already discovered quite a few of them. And all of them are a result of ancient collisions or ancient absorptions of various galaxies that orbited the Milky Way. That's how our galaxy grew so big. And the main core of this galaxy, along with its center, M54, is actually right here, in this region. Which just so happens to be very coincident with the location of the cocoon from the Fermi bubbles. Ok, but this could be just a coincidence. However, there's at least one more piece of evidence. As this image from the study illustrates, both the cocoon and the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy core also seem to have very similar shape, but more importantly, very similar orientation. And that by itself is already very difficult to reproduce by accident. So we have orientation, we have the shape, and we have the location. Unfortunately, the distance here is very difficult to determine, mostly because that's how things are in space. We can't really measure the redshift here, and we don't really have any other objects to compare this to, so distance-wise we don't really know where this is. But three pieces of evidence is enough to kind of assume that maybe, just maybe, this is exactly what produces the cocoon. And so the higher concentration of gamma rays that seem to be coming from the Fermi bubbles, in reality, seem to be actually coming from the core of Sagittarius Dwarf. But because of our position in the galaxy, it appears as if it's coming from the Fermi bubbles, even though it's really behind them. And in order to make their point even more scientific, the scientists decided to create several emission models with various explanations in those models, including the model where the cocoon was part of the Fermi bubbles, with only one of these simulations, only one of the models, reproducing what we're observing. If the emissions were coming from the Sagittarius dwarf, as shown in this image right here, we would get exactly the same gamma ray observations as we're actually seeing in real life, with all of the other models just not really being as convincing. 
and naturally because these are some of the brightest and the most powerful gamma rays produced in our galaxy, this has always kind of bugged the scientists. They wanted to know what exactly is producing this. Looks like now they kind of know. The brightest and the highest energy gamma ray radiation is not actually coming from the Milky Way disk. It's coming from the leftover Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. But that's just part of the answer. Still, what exactly is actually producing it though? What's causing these gamma rays even if it's coming from Sagittarius Dwarf? Well, normally in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, most of the gamma rays are produced by the collision between cosmic rays and various types of interstellar gas. It sort of kind of looks like this. You have the photon and the electron, and as one strikes the other, gamma rays are produced. And all of this is then seen in various gamma ray emissions coming from the Fermi bubbles. And these cosmic rays generally come from very distant objects, usually very powerful supermassive black holes in distant galaxies. But that gas came from the supermassive black hole in the middle of our own galaxy. For a Sagittarius dwarf though, this explanation doesn't really work. Mostly because we know that this is a much, much smaller satellite galaxy, and we know that for the most part, it seems to have been already stripped of all of its gas, very likely two to three billion years ago. And most of this gas is still kind of visible as the long string that stretches around the Milky Way. And so since there is probably no interstellar gas here to be interacting with the cosmic rays, this cannot really be the explanation. And the other explanation for very powerful emissions could be a lot of supernova, like huge amounts of supernova. But at the moment, it's kind of difficult to explain why there will be so many supernovae in this region and no other signs of these have been detected so far. And that kind of leaves us with maybe just one possible explanation. And that's actually a very similar explanation to how scientists try to explain the excess gamma rays in the middle of the Milky Way. This region might actually contain quite a lot of very powerful pulsars. Or essentially very powerful neutron stars, and specifically millisecond pulsars, that are spinning extremely fast, and as they spin, they emit a lot of radiation, and some of this radiation includes a lot of powerful gamma rays. But pulsars generally do not live very long, so there has to be a reason why they were suddenly created. And in this case, there is actually an explanation for that as well. Their existence can be explained by the most recent formation period in this particular galaxy as it interacted with the Milky Way. And today it's actually believed that as Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy orbited around the Milky Way, and as it passed through its disk, both galaxies experienced very dramatic star formation periods, which happened at least twice. And we actually discussed some of these discoveries in one of the older videos you can find in the description. And so if there are actual signs of star formation in the Milky Way, we expect these signs to be in the other galaxy as well. But naturally there is still something that we cannot explain. Why exactly is it so bright? Why is it so powerful? These emissions seem to be much brighter than the ones in the Milky Way galaxy, and even brighter than the ones in the nearby Andromeda galaxy. Although the scientists do provide at least one possible explanation. If these pulsars are relatively old, maybe 7 billion years old, and if they also have relatively low metal content, there is maybe a chance that they would be producing so many gamma rays. But this also means that we should be seeing very similar observations in other dwarf galaxies. For example, in the nearby large and small Magellanic clouds. At the moment, it doesn't really seem that way. So either something is really unusual about this particular galaxy, or the other explanation could maybe involve the mysterious dark matter. Some of the dark matter scientists have long proposed that dark matter particles should also be producing excess gamma ray observations. And so there's actually a chance that these gamma ray emissions could maybe be produced by the dark matter inside Sagittarius Dwarf, which already implies that the discoveries from the study are going to be discussed and analyzed for many years to come. It's either going to help us understand how galaxies evolve, or it's going to help us understand what exactly dark matter is and how exactly it acts in various galaxies, or possibly provide a lot more answers than we can even imagine. Either way, super important discovery, very important paper, and definitely an intriguing explanation to an old mystery. Which also means that we're going to be coming back and talking more about these galactic interactions and galactic collisions, and how they influence our galaxy and what effects they produce on the galaxy in some of the future videos as well. But you should also probably check out some of the previous videos that should be in the description. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.